We present The Absence of Mr. Glass, adapted for radio by John Scotney, with Andrew Sachs as Father Brown, Olivier Pierre as Flambeau, and Bernard Archard as Dr. Orion Hood. Excuse me. Yes? I, what do you want? Uh, my name is Brown. Father Brown. I believe a friend of mine, a Monsieur Flambeau, is a guest here. Monsieur Flambeau? Oh, come in. Oh, thank you. Wait here. Oh, thank you so much. Monsieur Flambeau? There's a clerical gentleman here says he knows you. Uh, Father Brown? Yes. Ah, my dear ah, Father Flambeau. What a pleasure to see you. <laughs> you had my message. Oh, indeed, yes. As soon as I learned you were visiting the resort, I told Mr. Um, uh, the gentleman who, who lives here, uh, and he, my host, is most anxious to make your acquaintance. Uh, uh, please, uh, would you tell the master Father Brown is here? Very good, sir. Uh, Flambeau, what is this? Why all this secrecy? Uh, the gentleman who lives here, the master, my host, who is it you're staying with? Let us simply say a very eminent consulting detective, uh, now living in retirement on the south coast and devoting himself to beekeeping. <gasps> Good heavens! You don't mean Shah! Shh, indeed. <laughs> My host does not like his real name to be used. Oh, but surely he has nothing to be ashamed of. No, 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 but uh, since his retirement from his all-too-well-known address in uh, Baker Street, he has no desire to be plagued by heads of state and baffled detectives every time a case of more than usual complexity ah, comes up. Ah, yes. So he chooses to call himself Dr. Hood. Dr. Hood? Dr. Oh. Orion Hood, my dear Father Brown. Ah, Dr. Hood. Oh, you know. <laughs> the name Hood may be assumed, but as it happens, the title of doctor is not. I hold the degrees of doctor of letters from several universities, though I am not, my regret, a doctor of medicine, like my old colleague and chronicler. Ah, but I observe that it is blustery on the coast. So blustery, I perceive, that you abandoned your original intention of walking from the town by the seashore, and instead turned inland and came over the downs. Oh, sir, oh, mon Dieu, you did just so much. Oh, my no. dear sir, excellent. Elementary, my dear Flambeau. Elementary. Well, you know my methods. Father Brown's soutan is covered in specks of salt, which suggests that a strong wind has blown sea spray onto it. Yeah. But it is no longer wet so it's had time to dry. Therefore, it must be some time since he left the seashore. Of course. And you will, of course, have noticed that his boots have both sand and the chalky mud of the downs on them. I'm so sorry. I must wipe them. Come through to my study. Oh. My admirable housekeeper has prepared us tea and muffin. Oh, how's that? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Bush, you may pour tea now. There will be three of us. Yes, sir. Uh, you are no doubt wondering why I have invited Monsieur Flambeau to stay with me, Father Brown. Uh, why? Yes, as a matter of fact, Mr... Uh, Hood. Uh, Hood, Father Brown. Well, during his singular criminal career, Monsieur Flambeau yes, had a hand in several cases which, I must say, taxed my powers to the limits. Oh, you are too kind. No, Brown, no, no. And he's kindly agreed to be my guest for a few days and discuss them with me. Yes, but uh, pray sit down, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, stop! Uh, Father Brown, no, I beg you, do not sit there. Why, what is it? Oh, oh good heavens, I, my violin. Oh, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I'm afraid my habits remain somewhat untidy. Uh, do, do please sit down. <laughs> uh, and if you would care to fill your pipe, I have some excellent Balkan tobacco somewhere. Mm, somewhere. Where did I put it? Uh, it's in a slipper, a, a Persian slipper. It's stuck to the mantelpiece with a knife, sir. Oh, yes, yes, of course, thank you. <laughs> Old habits die hard, gentlemen. They do indeed, sir. That will be all, thank you, Mrs. Bush. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Now, Father Brown. Yes. You are visiting one of your former parishioners, a Mrs. McNabb, a widow who is in some distress about her daughter. Yes, yes. 
goodness, how could you deduce that? Oh, my methods are sometimes quite straightforward. When Mrs. McNabb saw Flombo in town yesterday, she recognized him as a close friend of her old parish priest and a frequent visitor to your room. And it was she who told me you were coming down to see her. Mrs. McNabb lives in one of those straggly houses near the town's end. Uh, she has one daughter. Maggie. Uh, Ma yes. Pray proceed. Well, she lets lodgings, and at the moment has just the one lodger, uh, this young man called Mr... Uh, 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 Todd Hunter. Todd Hunter. Uh, and uh, he wants to marry the young woman. And what does she want? Why, she wants to marry him. That's just the awful complication. Uh, you see, she won't let them get married. Uh, Mrs. McNabb won't. And the fellow is an ingenious rascal, no doubt. I recall a similar case, once brought to me by an illustrious client. Yes, I'm sure. But young James Todd Hunter is a very decent man, as far as I know. He seems to have quite a pocketful of money, but nobody knows what his trade is. Mm. Mrs. McNabb is quite sure it's something dreadful and probably connected with dynamite. Ah, yes. In the case of the illustrious client, uh, my yes, own experience... Uh, yes. No, no, no. The dynamite must be of a shy and noiseless sort, for no one's heard it. <laughs> Yet it seems the poor fellow shuts himself up for several hours a day and works away at something behind a locked door. Well, Mrs. McNabb is very distraught. She told me a strange tale of, um, of two voices heard talking in the room, though when she opened the door, Todd Hunter was alone. Interesting. Uh, but also, he has a huge trunk in the corner of his room which he keeps locked all day. Mrs. McNabb even half suggested that this other man crawls out from it every night. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt it is full of Transylvanian soil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? Uh, sorry, I don't quite follow. Uh, Transylvania. Oh, but uh, well, what is this oh, disturbance? Oh. oh, thank heavens you're uh, here. Calm yourself, young lady. Calm yourself. I'm extremely sorry, Doctor Hood. I tried to stop her, but this young woman said she must see the famous detective. I see. Well, it is a most irregular proceeding, but... Uh... Excuse me interrupting, Your Honor, but I must see Father Brown at once. It's a matter of extreme urgency. Father Brown? Oh, I see. Then you are Maggie McNabb, I presume. How did you know that, sir? Oh, it's obvious, my dear young lady. Father Brown arrived in the town only today in order to visit your family. He is unlikely to be acquainted with anyone else here, certainly not anyone who reposes such trust in him that in an emergency they travel two miles out here to seek his assistance rather than summon the immediate aid of the local police. Now, I beg you, tell us what has happened. And Flombo, yes? ask my man to get the dog cart ready. I dare venture we shall be needing it. I have a four-wheeler waiting outside, sir. You are indeed a young lady of enterprise. Come, gentlemen, let us hear Miss McNabb's story in the cab. Now then, Maggie, tell us what has happened. Oh, Father Brown, I'm terribly afraid that James... James has been murdered. The father of what? what? That man Glass has been with him again. I heard it all through the door. Yes? They were talking quite plain. James speaks low with a bow, and the other voice was high and quavery. Uh, uh, that, that man, Glass, uh, who is he, uh, this, uh, Mr. Glass? In truth, I don't know, sir. I know nothing about him, except his name is Glass. Mm. They were quarrelling about money, I think, for I heard James say again and again, oh, damn it, Mr. Glass, and then two, three, Mr. Glass, damn it. But uh, what makes you think the young man has been murdered? Well, after I heard their quarrelling, there was a silence. Yes? I tried to break the door down, but I couldn't. Uh, so what did you do? Then I ran round to the backyard and managed to climb onto the window sill that looks into the room. It was all dim, but there were all sorts of things scattered about. And I, I swear I saw James lying huddled up in a corner, as if he were drugged or strangled. Oh, this is serious. <laughs> Whip up, Tabby! Tabby, me! There seem to be some playing cards littered about. Is that so? Huh? And some wine glasses. Yes. And that was strange, because James is almost teetotal. Right. Oh, and one of them was broken. Interesting. At least one. And, and there was a gentleman's silk top hat. Top hat? And there was... Oh, my God! What? What? Here. I've just realized what it was. Yes. A long knife or sword lying glinting on the ground. Oh, oh, Father Brown, I hope James is all right. 
I uh, there, my child. Oh, mm. uh, you, you say Mr. Todd Hunter is not given to strong drink. Is he in any other way profligate with his money? Is he a gambler? Oh, no, sir. James is very careful. Mm. Not mean, you understand. Just careful. <laughs> We were saving to get married. Oh, come, my dear. Ah, here we are. Come. Gentlemen, come, let us descend. There is no time to waste. Gentlemen. Mrs. McNabb! Mrs. McNabb! My mother isn't at home, sir. Oh. But I have the key. Oh, gentlemen. Now, Miss McNabb, I hardly know what we shall find upstairs. You will understand if I say that it would be best if you did not come up for the moment. Father Brown? Uh, yes? Whilst I would greatly value your help upstairs, I, I feel you can be of even greater assistance to Miss McNabb as her friend and pastor. If you would be good enough to remain with her while Monsieur Flambeau and I go up. Yes. She seems to be in great need of comfort. Uh, yes, of course. Mm, come now, Flambeau. Maybe There's not a moment to be lost. Uh, there. That must be the one. It's the only shut door of any of the rooms that face the garden. Uh, uh, Monsieur Fomo, you are a little more burly than Mr. McNabb. Uh, <laughs> do you think you could break it down? Oh, I should be able to. <laughs> oh, it's stronger than I thought. Oh, here, let me try again. Voila, uh, ça uh, This way. No wonder it wouldn't budge. Look at the size of those bolts. And secured on the inside. That is most remarkable, my dear Fombeau. Now, let us enter. Ah, there, unless I'm greatly mistaken, lies Mr. Todd Hunter. Is he dead? Oh, no, here, he is not. Mm. No. Mm. No, he appears to be mm. gagged and tied up. Mm. Oh, this is most interesting, most interesting. Yes. Doctor, your stethoscope, please. <laughs> I am not a doctor. You're thinking of... Yes, uh, of course. <laughs> Foolish of me. <laughs> uh, uh, let me see. Yes. His pulse is a little exalted, but basically normal. And there seems to be mm. no sign of injury. Mm. Well, uh, aren't you going to untie him? No. <laughs> but why not? I have my reasons. However, until I am completely sure... I would rather not reveal them. Oh, yes. Mm. yes. Here is everything just as that admirable young woman described it. Playing cards, wine goblets, broken and complete top hat. Ah, yes, and here is the sword, I think. Now, uh, this is very curious. Do you observe? Oh, my God, yes. Th there's, there's a drop of blood on mm. it. Well, that surely, in the circumstances, mm. might reasonably be expected. What is curious is that there should be so little blood, a mere drop. Ah, the top hat is remarkable. Now, where is my lens? Um, oh, what do you make of the hat, Monsieur Flambeau? It must belong to Mr. Glass. It is exceptionally large, much, much too large for Mr. Fudd. Oh, 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 I see the oh, faculty oh, of observation oh, is contagious. Oh, yes. <laughs> it is indeed very large. I have only ever known one man with such a large cranium. You don't mean Professor. No, 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 it's impossible. It, it cannot be he, no. Um, come over here, would you? Yes? Now, would you reach up? Uh, uh, like this? Yes. Yes, I thought so. Uh, you are a large man, Flombo, yet you cannot reach within six inches of this gas bracket. But what do you see on the bracket? Uh, a small fragment of glass. Uh, what of it? You see, but you do not notice. <laughs> it is a fragment of wine glass. Clearly, the hand holding it must have smashed it against the bracket. Now, Todd Hunter here is quite short, so it must be his mysterious visitor. He must be a, a giant of a man. Yes, but an elderly giant and something of a dandy. His hat is of a stylish shape and systematically brushed and burnished, though not new. <laughs> and from this you deduce that he is an old man? No, no, but if you examine it under a lens, it has other peculiarities. The hair of human beings falls out in varying degrees, but always falls out slightly. So I should expect to find a number of hairs on the hat band, but there are very few, and, and what there are, are all pure white. Oh, yeah. Which suggests... An almost bald, white-haired man. An elderly man, as is confirmed by the querulous voice Miss McNabb heard. <laughs> Who is it? Who's there? Oh, it's, 
Tony me. Uh, Mrs. McNabb has returned, so I left young Maggie with her. Oh, Father Brown, it is magnificent. Uh, Mr. Hood... Uh, uh, doctor... Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, doctor Hood has established that Mr. Glass is tall from this fragment of broken wine glass on the gas bracket, that he has an enormous cranium and is a, a, a dandy uh, from his hat. Oh. And also, from his hat, that he is an old man, because his hat band has few hairs on it, and they are pure white. Really, that does indeed sound remarkable. <laughs> but it, isn't this poor James? <laughs> oh, well, uh, alive, I'm glad to see, but what, why have you not untied him? I will explain all presently. It was by being too precipitate in the case of the giant rat of Sumatra. I'm so sure he's all right. Oh, you have my word of honour. You need have no worries for Mr. Todd Hunter. Oh, yes, oh, oh. Oh. oh, well, uh, good. Then do please continue. Uh, this is all most interesting. Thank you. Now, I may say that it is possible that the man in glass was born or nervous to recipition rather than age. Mr. Todd Hunter, it has been remarked, is a quiet, thrifty gentleman, essentially an abstainer. These cards and wine cups are no part of his normal habit. They have been produced for a particular companion, but we may go farther. Mr. Todd Hunter may or may not possess this wine service, but he seems to possess no wine. What, then, do these vessels contain? Uh, uh, well, what do you think? Well, I would suggest whiskey or brandy. From a flask in Mr. Glass's pocket. Exactly, ah. exactly. Uh, now we have something like a, the picture of the man, or, or at least the type. Tall, elderly, fashionable, but somewhat frayed, certainly fond of play and strong waters, perhaps too fond of them. Mr. Glass is a gentleman not unknown on the fringes of society. It is quite remarkable, your construction, my dear sir. Quite remarkable. Oh, I, I must congratulate you on it. No, oh, it is merely a simple use of the scientific imagination, Father Brown. <laughs> my method is founded on the observance of trifles, the application of logic. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. But, uh... Yes? Um, shouldn't we tell Miss McNabb that Mr. Todd Hunter is alive? Hmm, yes, perhaps it would be as well. Would you call her up, Father Brown? Oh, yes, yes, I will. Um, uh, Miss McNabb... I fear, Monsieur Flombo, that what I have to say may well distress Miss McNabb. How do you mean? Well, we've seen something of the figure and quality of Mr. Glass. Um, what are the chief facts known of Mr. Todhunter here? <laughs> there are substantially three. <laughs> that he is economical, that he is more or less wealthy, and that he has a secret. <laughs> now, are these not the chief marks of a man who is likely to be blackmailed? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> James! Thank heavens you're all right! Are you all right? Why is James tied up? There are sufficient reasons. Father Brown, why is James still tied up? I, uh, 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 yes, Dr. Hood, why is he still tied up? Patience, my dear lady, patience. Oh. I was just explaining, Father Brown, that Mr. Todd Hunter is just the kind of man who is likely to be blackmailed. Blackmailed? Now, is it not equally obvious to the trained mind that the faded finery, the profligate habits, and the shrill irritation of Mr. Glass are the unmistakable marks of the kind of man who blackmails? <sighs> and so these two men met here today and quarrelled using blows and a bare weapon? Perhaps, um, it is a maxim of mine, never... Are to... you going to take these ropes off? No. Mm -hmm. No. I think those ropes will do very well till your friends, the police, bring the handcuffs. What do you mean? Because you find Mr. Todd Hunter tied up, you all jump to the conclusion that Mr. Glass had tied him up, uh, and then, I suppose, escaped. Well, there are four objections to this. I should be very interested to hear them. So should I. Very well, you shall. First... Why should a gentleman as dressy as our friend Glass leave his hat behind if he left of his own free will? Second, how did he leave? How do you mean? The window is secured by iron bars. The door, as you discovered, Mr. Frombo, was bolted from the inside very securely. Thirdly, this blade here has a tiny touch of blood at the point, but there is no wound on Mr. Todd Hunter. Mr. Glass took that wound away with him. He took it away with him? Dead or alive, Miss McNabb. Consider, is it not much more likely that the blackmailed person would try to kill his incubus rather than the blackmailer would try to kill the goose that lays his golden eggs? Here, I think we have a pretty common story. Todd Hunter was being blackmailed and... Yes, yes, but the ropes. Ah, <laughs> the ropes. <laughs> I have looked at all the knots on Mr. Todd Hunter. You will recall, my dear Flombo, it was the first thing I did upon entering the room. Yes? Well, I have made quite a study of knots. I, I've even written a small monograph on the subject. 
Uh, come. I suspected something of the sort the moment I realised the door was bolted from the inside. Every one of these knots Mr. Todd Hunter made himself, and each is so designed that he might loosen it himself. <laughs> you are a formidable antagonist, Mr. Todd Hunter, a man of singular ingenuity. You mean that... Um... Yes, yes, this whole affair of the ropes is a clever trick, a oh. fake, to make us think him the victim of the struggle instead of the wretched glass. <laughs> then where is Mr. Glass? Well, I do not wish to distress you, Miss McNair, but your mother may not have been far off the mark when she attributed a sinister value to that extremely large trunk in the corner. I suspect that if we were able to obtain the keys to it, we would find... Say it again, please. What? Do you mean that those knots are tied by Mr. Todd Hunter? Yes. And that they're tied in such a way that it is intended that he should be able also to untie them himself? Precisely. That is what I mean. Jerusalem. I wondered if it could possibly be it. Excuse me. Um, Mr. Todd Hunter, may I do, just... Oh. Oh, yes, yes, I see what you mean. But, uh... <laughs> Father Brown? Yes. Yes, you're right. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Can't you see it in the man's face? What on earth do you mean? But look at his eyes. His eyes do look queer. You brutes. I believe it's hurting him. James. James, are you all right? Oh, 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 oh. No, no. Not that, I think. The, the eyes have a certain, what shall I say, uh, singular expression, but I would interpret those transverse wrinkles as expressing rather such slight psychological abnormality. Oh, oh gosh. Gosh. <laughs> Can't you see that he's laughing? Laughing? What on earth is it to laugh at? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, I think he's laughing at you. And indeed, I'm a little inclined to laugh at myself. And now I know the profession of Mr. Todd Hunter, uh, the, or rather, the profession he aspires well, to. Is this relevant? I, I hardly think what Mr. Todd Hunter does for a living is germane to the issue. <laughs> you amaze me, my friend. Oh, no, but Mr. Todd Hunter would like to amaze you. <laughs> Oh, my dear, Mr. Todd Hunter, please, bear with me a moment. <laughs> what a fool I was to forget we are in a seaside town. <laughs> Father Brown, I don't understand. I don't know. Oh, Dr. Hood, you are a great poet. I beg your pardon? You have called an uncreated being out of the void. How much more godlike that is than if you had only ferreted out the mere facts. Indeed, the mere facts are rather ordinary by comparison. Father Brown, I have long admired your successes in my field, oh, but... Mere trifles, trifles compared to your triumphs. Oh, oh, well, you should not believe all you read. But now, I confess, I, I have no notion what you are talking about. My facts are all inevitable, though necessarily incomplete. A place may be permitted to intuition or poetry, if you prefer the term, but only because the corresponding details cannot as yet be ascertained in the absence of Mr. Glass. Ah, that's it. That is it. That's the first idea to get fixed. The absence of Mr. Glass. He is so extremely absent. I suppose that there never was anybody as absent as Mr. Glass. Do you mean he is uh, absent from town? I mean he is absent from everywhere. He is absent from the nature of things, so to speak. Do you seriously mean that there is no such person? Oh, it does seem a pity. Then how do you explain the first proof we found? If there is no Mr. Glass, sir, uh, whose hat is this? Exactly. Yes. It is yours, is it not, Mr. Todd? Oof, 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 oof. <laughs> uh, but, uh, look... He doesn't fit. Uh, 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 he, he couldn't possibly wear it. My friend, I never said he could wear it. I said it was his hat. Or, if you insist on a shade of difference, a hat that is his. How do you mean? Well, Maggie, if you go to a hatter's shop, you'll see lots of hats that belong to the hatter, but none of them his hat. Ah, uh, but the hatter can get money out of his stock of new hats. What could Mr. Tudhunter get out of his exceptionally large old hat? Hmm? Rabbits. Rabbits? rabbits? White rabbits. <laughs> yes. The hat has few traces of hair, not because Mr. Glass is bald, but because it has never been worn. If you were to examine those white hairs you saw under a microscope, Dr. Hood, you would find they are not human, but rabbit. Lost while the white rabbit was being pulled out of the hat. And, yes, it's the same, 
same with the sword. Mr. Todd Hunter has no wound on him, but he has a slight wound inside him. Uh, yes. uh, which, to judge from the expression on his face, uh, is not a uh, serious uh, one. Uh, and the cards? are for card tricks. They are scattered about because Mr. Todd Hunter is not yet very good at card tricks any more than he is as yet good at sword swallowing. Ooh, ooh. Hence the slight nick. <laughs> <laughs> what about the ropes? Uh, this gentleman says James should be able to escape from them. Ah, precisely. He should be able to. He is also practicing to be an escapologist. Mm. At oh. present he seems better able to tie himself in knots than to escape from those knots. <laughs> but what about the two voices I heard? Uh, have you never heard a ventriloquist? Oh, oh. Ventriloquist. Your reputation is clearly deserved. You are a singularly ingenious person. But there is just one part of Mr. Glass you have not succeeded in explaining away. Uh, yes? His name. Miss McNabb distinctly heard Mr. Todd Hunter say, Damn it, Mr. Glass. Well, that's the silliest part of the whole silly story. Um, since he manifestly is unable to escape from his own bonds, Flambeau, would you cut him free with his own sword? <coughs> Certainly. Yes, then perhaps Mr. Todd Hunter will explain. Oh, thank you. James, are you all right? Yes, Maggie, I'm all right. Oh, oh he's beginning to think they'd never release me. Uh, I must apologise, Mr. Todd Hunter. I should think so, too. Oh, no, not at all, not at all. A perfectly natural mistake. Aha, uh -huh. but who is this Mr. Glass? Ah, uh, well, you see, I was practising juggling with glasses. Only I haven't quite got the knack of it yet. To tell you the truth, I nearly did myself a nasty injury when one shattered against the gas bracket. Oh, I see. Yeah, and I, I tend to talk to myself when I'm concentrating. It's a silly habit, I know. So as I toss the glasses up, I'd say one, two, three, and so on. Only I kept missing them. And every time I missed a glass, I'm afraid I used rather strong language. What you heard me saying was one, two, three, etc., then... Mr. Glass. Huh? Miss uh, a glass. Mr. Glass. Oh, Mr. Glass. Mr. Glass. <laughs> That's right. Oh, and uh, by the way, I had to lock the door. Partly because I didn't want Miss McNabb seeing the tricks till I got them right. Partly because, well, it's a thing about being a magician. You've got to keep your secrets secret. <laughs> oh, my card. Oh, Mr. Glass. Thank you. <laughs> Zaladin, the world's greatest conjurer, contortionist, ventriloquist and... Human kangaroo. <coughs> uh, you will be appearing next month at the Empire Pavilion. You are Zaladin, the world's greatest conjurer, etc. Yeah, well, I know it's coming on a bit strong, sir, but that's the nature of these things, you know. The truth is, gentlemen, I've just been left a bit of money and took the opportunity to get started in the business. All that world's greatest stuff. Well, I'm afraid I rather overestimated my powers. Oh, you dear are not James. the only person to have done that, Mr. Todd Hunter. I thought I had schooled myself to believe only the empirical evidence of my eyes, for which reason I am obliged to tell you, Father Brown, uh, yes. I cannot believe in a deity. Oh. And yet, I confess, I believe the whole romantic fantasy I had spun myself. How could that be? Well, uh, you will excuse me for saying so, Dr. Hood, but I have often observed that when people cease to believe in God, they... Um, they do not then, as one might expect, believe in nothing. It is rather the case that they will believe in anything. In The Absence of Mr. Glass by G.K. Chesterton, the part of Father Brown was played by Andrew Sachs. Flambeau, Olivier Pierre. Orion Hood, Bernard Archard. Maggie, Deborah Makepeace. Todd Hunter, Kim Wall. Housekeeper, Margaret Ward. The Absence of Mr. Glass was adapted by John Scotney and directed in Bristol by Alec Reed. Mm -hmm.